I'm very pleased to moderate this panel this afternoon. Um, we have around the table four people who I think can really give us um, wonderfully different sides of the, different views of the elephant, um, who can help us to see how we have to come together to think about how we, how we look at and address the complex challenges of violence that are undermining the lives of Mexi uh, people, so many people in Mexico and, and people around the world. Um, Although I'm going to, you have in your, in your packets the long bios for each person, so I won't detail those, but just to give you a snapshot of the kinds of views we have around the table, Michelle um, Breslauer works for the Institute for Economics and Peace, which is known, of course, for the global peace indices, um, which has focused for years now on, on indices of, that have to do with violent uh, armed conflict, particularly, and is, although it's branched into other arenas recently. And this is now focusing, the Mexico Peace Index, of course, is focusing on a country that's not formally at war, but has a new kind of violence that's neither war nor peace. And Enrique Betancur, um, as many of you may know already, is an architect who's been specializing in violence and crime prevention. Uh, in, in an area that's the cusp between what we think of as armed conflict and we think about and what we think of as intimate violence and the, the role of violence in communities is an area that overlap where these two arenas overlap in very awkward and uh, unmapped ways. And Miguel Alvarez comes to us uh, from a long trajectory of work with what, what we would call structural violence, poverty, uh, social inequality, the long history of of, of life in so many countries that causes all different, uh, a range of violence from intimate family violence to the, the structural and, and symbolic violences that uh, manifest in different ways in people's lives. Um, and John Feely at the State Department, of course, is like many other policymakers, sitting at a table in which he has to think about what to do with all these ranges of violence says, through concrete policy <laughs> perspectives and, and proposals. Um, and this is one of the major challenges now, is how to, how to face the uh, task of addressing violence that has a hybrid form and doesn't have clear and concise names and no, no clear boundaries now between X and Y, Z kinds of violences. The violence in, in Mexico is, is not simply criminal violence. It's not simply political violence. It's neither war nor is it peace. Um, and just, but just as Gertrude Stein told us about roses, violence is violence is violence. And um, so we have to figure out how to understand this phenomenon in a way that allows us to deal with it more holistically and more effectively than we've been able to do until now. And I just want to leave you, and then I'll turn it over to the first speaker, with a wonderful quote that I found was very clarifying for me about the nature of the challenge. And he was quoting a member of the Peruvian Peace and Reconciliation Commission who said in his reflections about the work that they had done, he said, I still remember the faces of the people from the rural areas that were coming to the commission's hearings. They explained how the violence had been the air they had breathed ever since they had arrived into this world, like the bread they eat each day. <coughs> Excuse me for my coarseness. <coughs> they didn't understand why we were the, while we were while, why we were only interested in the violence from 1980 to 2000. Only that practiced by the armed forces. Only that practiced by the police and the other armed groups. The violence didn't come from the outside. It's intrinsic to the daily life of these people. For us, the violence was an affront to our dignity, a shock, a violation of our fundamental rights. For them. The violence is normalized, something they feel each time they breathe. Bridging, bridging this experiential chasm is, I think, one of the major pending tasks of people who are concerned with peacemaking and violence prevention in the world. And so I look very much forward to hearing the interventions of our panel. And we're going to start um, with Enrique and move in this direction. And so thank you very much to each of you. And we'll each, uh, each panelist will talk for about seven to eight minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Tani. Thanks, everybody, for, for being here today. I, I have the difficult task of in starting uh, introducing this complex uh, problem in this very complex country. 
Uh, but I will do it from, from the perspective that I... Can, can I, Tani, may I have the... I'll do it just very briefly using a PowerPoint presentation just to, 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 to show how, in my personal experience, I have um, addressed this problem from a practitioner's perspective, also from a policy-making uh, perspective, and now from an international development perspective. The first thing to, to note, is, and it's probably something that is already um, um, known by all of you, is the process of how Mexico has really seen a, a tremendous increase in the amount of uh, murder, murders happening uh, in the country for the last years. Uh, up all, uh, until 2007, uh, Mexico was relatively reducing uh, uh, the, the, the murder rate in the country in a very sustainable way, all, like, like dating back all the way to, to 1910, more or less. So, so Mexico was do doing well in terms of uh, that trend, even though we know that there were some structural problems happening in the country. 2007 marks uh, the year in which this trend completely bounced back. Uh, and, and just to move very quickly forward to 2010, I want you to imagine yourselves um, uh, in a meeting with, with the president. Uh, while, while we started dealing with these issues, we, we understood, first of all, that the problem of violence in Mexico was con being concentrated in very specific places. Uh, only 162 municipalities out of more than 2,000 concentrated 80% of the, of the murder rate uh, in the country. So the first, first big lesson about a, pro a problem that is perceived to be everywhere in Mexico is that violence is highly concentrated in some places. This problem was concentrated mostly in urban areas. And as much as you can see also in the United States, for example, or any other country almost in the world, um, you know, violence even concentrates in neighborhoods or even in, in micro locations. So to give you an example, 2010 was a year in which we started and triggered a very uh, comprehensive strategy. I was working at that time for the Mexican government in Ciudad Juarez. And even, even those days, being at the most murderous city in the world, you could see, uh, speaking of resilience, a city of 1.3 million inhabitants every day doing business, doing shopping, taking kids to school, and, and having a normal life, quote unquote. Uh, but there were no go zones. So, so we understood that from the policy perspective, place was a very important thing to consider in terms of how to, to proceed. This is Ciudad Juarez. What you see in a, in a, in a more, in a darker area is Ciudad Juarez, is, is the urban fabric of Ciudad Juarez in 2000, in 1980. What you see as the whole is, to, is Ciudad Juarez in, in, in 2010. Uh, in this same period of time, Ciudad Juarez went from being, it, it grew twice in terms of population, but it grew six times in terms of size. If you put yourselves very quickly in the shoes of a mayor, and, or in the shoes of the chief of police, or in the shoes of the, uh, the guy who's providing basic services to the city, you can start understanding how a lot of people were underserved in, uh, in, these, in these places. This is a, the story of Ciudad Juarez, but this is not a typical from the rest of the country. This is a typical urbanization pattern that follows many of these places where the violence was, was being concentrated. If you wanted to understand more about Juarez, I mean, around this area is where the, the airport's here, city center's here. The violence was mostly concentrated in this area and in this area, right? So, so there were areas of the, of the city that you could really go, like, no matter what time, and there were areas that no matter what time you could not uh, even visit. Very important graphic for me, this one that I'm here. So I was, we were saying Mexico's, Mexico's murder rate went from being eight to almost 18 as an average. Try to imagine yourselves now in a meeting with the president, and this actually happened, when someone starts addressing the president saying, Sir President, we have a problem of we have more than doubled our murder rate in this country in the last you know, three, four years. We have to design a policy to address this problem. The fact that that was the conversation was very, very alarming for many of us because we were not addressing the, 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 the nuances of the problem. We said, Mr. President, no, wait, 
The problem is that this problem, this problem is, is concentrated in certain places in, and within certain populations. Let's try to look uh, into those details. So for example, we, instead of looking at the country as a whole, we started looking at how did it look like this, 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 uh, this rate for young men. The rate was not anymore 18.9, but 46 homicides per 100,000 for young men. If, they, if young men, as we know, do, don't only live in Mexico, but they live in a state, let's say Chihuahua 2010, the murder rate for being young and men goes all the way up to 300. If you're based in Ciudad Juarez, then the rate goes all the way to 500 homicides per 100,000. This is just by being young and men. When, I'm not saying here you are part of a cartel, you're, you're, you just became a gang member, you have more risk factors uh, associated to you. So the problem is that if we design policies to address this average problem, we will not at all meet, meet, uh, understand the problem. We have to design solutions to address the problem at this scale. And this is something I think Tani also has done a lot in terms of uh, explaining uh, the, the, the conditions of chronic violence. And those conditions really, really require a different kind of thinking and different type of policies. Um, so just coming back very quickly to this notion of resilience and conflict, the sources and, and, and the potential solutions for those, I think you have to think in terms of the discussion about resilience has been uh, taking different paths. Depending who you speak with, uh, they take into consideration violence, sometimes they don't. If you, if you I have been in conferences where, where resilience is completely attached to the discussion of the environment without taking into consideration, for example, violence. In other places, violence is a central piece of resilience. I think it's very important to understand and make distinctions regarding resilience in terms of the individual, resilience in terms of the community, at the city level, or even at the, at the state level. And the type of responses we have to put in place to address this problem, I think, have to do with, for example, at the individual level, there's a lot. I'm, I think I saw something in the agenda that was discussed today on neuroscience and conflict. I imagine a lot of things were discussed around character. We found a lot. There's a lot of science behind the possibility of working in character to really uh, transform uh, the way people uh, interact with violence. At the community level, social cohesion and, and social norms, being able, uh, if, if you are aware of the work of Nicholas Christakis and, 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 and the social network mapping uh, new, let's say, science, you will understand that you intervene in a social system in very particular moments with very particular uh, uh, members, you will be able to transform the way these people relate to each other and build resilience. At the city level, it's about the systems of the city. And at the national level, I think this is very important, uh, it's about the perceived justice, procedural justice, and actual justice, the, the, the application of law enforcement. When we talk about peaceful uh, solutions to violence, I think we have to bring into, into the conversation law enforcement. This is something we tried many times in Mexico not to touch on, to, to solve violence with social means. And I think one of the biggest lessons uh, is you have to use law enforcement, you know, strictly following human rights procedures and everything, but law enforcement is really instrumental in the capacity of bringing down, reducing uh, violence uh, in the first place. Um, I think, I personally believe, that all of them can be addressed at the community level. Uh, at, at the end, when you have law enforcement intervening, you do receive that at the community level. Individuals interact with each other at the community level. And cities also provide services at that scale. We, at least from my understanding, it, the, the potential solutions are completely based at this social and spatial scale. And for that, we've been developing yeah. for a number of years. I, I won't go into detail in, uh, for this, but just like how do you introduce a blended approach, a place-based approach that blends in law enforcement and social prevention uh, uh, approaches. Uh, a number of different moments within this graph have been tried in Latin America, in Mexico, and the United States. You have focused deterrence in the United States, qualified territorial control through UPP, uh, uh, UPPs in, in Brazil, for example. Tertiary secondary prevention schemes to address the, those who are at high risk. And then slowly moving forward, 
trying to reduce the presence of law enforcement all the way to community policing and increasing and ramping up social prevention all the way to have primary prevention as mainstreamed. What we have done so far in terms of policy is start here. We want to start with social prevention and with community policing in places like the one that I showed before, in places where the murder rate, the social norms, everything is against you. And, and I think uh, one of the big lessons in terms of prevention uh, versus law enforcement is that you have to start reducing first uh, uh, the trends and, and, the, and the norms that are causing violence at the community level, and then slowly introducing other types of services um, um, to really l sustain those reductions through time. That's, that's uh, how uh, very quickly I try to uh, you know, draw, draw a panorama of what Mexico is facing at this moment, but also you know, come up with, a, with an idea of, of potential solutions that have been already tried uh, in some contexts. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Tani, for moderating this. Um, let me say that my comments are drawn from uh, my personal observation. Um, I was a diplomat in Mexico from 2000 to 2003. I returned, and I was our deputy chief of mission, and then the charge uh, when we didn't have an ambassador there from 2000. 2012. Um, I say this because I want it clear that I am not an academic. I am a consumer of plenty of academic research. Um, but most, as Tani said, most of my observations come from the perspective of being a policymaker and a policy implementer and somebody who is interested in the root causes and the drivers, but whose daily bread is to try to find solutions with them. So when I look at Mexico and the study that I've done personally, I see that it's, it, you could divide it any number of ways, but for the purposes of my uh, intervention here, I see two general baskets of drivers of violence in Mexico. One of them is historical and societal, and one of them is structural. The historical and the societal, and note that I don't say cultural. Um, I've seen an awful lot of mostly press articles and folks that I think are doing bad analysis, who will speak about the violent nature of Mexicans and the Mexican people. I firmly believe I worked in Colombia in the 1990s. Uh, I've worked in El Salvador. There is no one people who are more genetically disposed to violence than any other group of people. But history and society do have a, a very profound impact on how the Peruvian gentleman uh, described his experience of, of violence. So. I think if you look historically, Mexico has a federal system. Um, I have never lived in a country that has been less federally administered. Uh, it is more like Paris than, uh, and France than it is the United States. I always thought of it as federal versus feudal. Uh, we live here in the United States with tremendous ignorance of Mexico and the history of Mexico, and we live in stereotypes. Mexico is an incredibly broad and deep and intricate mosaic of various small societies. Um, and I think that the manner in which a feudal system coexisted with a federal, a nominally federal government, gives you a, a glimpse into why violence in Mexico of a particularly Mexican brand has developed. One of the results of that is, is a history of very weak law enforcement. Nobody in Mexico ever wants to be a cop. Nobody ever born thinking I'm going to be a cop and that's going to be on, on kids' days in school. Cops don't go into the school. Firemen don't go into the schools. They don't think of public service in a way that we do, say, in the United States or in other places where there is a career path, where it's honorable, where that public service is considered something that should be cherished by society and supported by society. Um, there in Mexico historically has been an inefficient and non-transparent judicial system. Uh, this is historical. Go back to the Napoleonic Code, to the, the Spanish there. Justice systems, not just in Mexico, but throughout the rest of the hemisphere as well, were set up not, as it says in our system and the Supreme Court of the United States, equal justice under the law, but they were set up for the benefit and for the prerogatives of wealthy elites. 
period. And there's been no question about that. And Mexico is in the middle of attacking this. But remember, changing a judicial system is like changing a democracy's stem cells. It's at the very core of what a society and a government is. You also had um, the 1910 revolution, which had a tremendous effect on Mexico and the explosive violence that came out of that and the reaction to it. Mexico goes into a period of seven decades where one party governs, and what is the principal value of that government? Stability. Stability above everything else. And so as a result, what you end up with is a system that is, again, federal in name, incredibly centralized in practice, and an awful lot of inattention to the small feud, feudal areas that grow up around there. But all government authority is very concentrated in a presidentialist system. What does that lead to in terms of their foreign policy? A policy of non-interventionism, a policy that Mexicans will refer to as política de avestruz. It's the ostrich that sticks its head in the sand. Pay no attention to what's going on in here. I'll pay no attention to you. As a result, you end up with a very, very corrupt patronage type system and a foreign policy that purposely keeps the rest of the world at arm's length especially the United States, because the last time we got in there, we took one-third of their country, and they kind of still remember that. And we have difficulty, as Americans, understanding that. Why is the Mexican sense of sovereignty so heightened? Why is it so prickly? There are good historical reasons for it. All right, let's talk about the structural drivers of violence. If you take a look at the development, and here I'm referring only to organized crime and narco-trafficking. And there are many types of violence, and I'm, I'm, obviously we can get into it later. For many years, Colombia controlled the cocaine business. If you all go back to the 1980s, the cocaine cowboys and Pablo Escobar and the Cali Cartel, etc. They made the product. It only grows in three or four countries in the Andes. They made it, they shipped it, and they distributed it in the United States. How did they ship it? Originally, they shipped it through the Caribbean. And that's the Miami Vice days. And when U.S. law enforcement came up, uh, began to react to that and shut off the Caribbean route, they started coming up the isthmus. That gets you right up through Central America, gets you into Mexico. The Mexicans, or I should say the Colombians, as they began to partner with the United States, and they did 90% of the work, both financially and in terms of the blood, sweat, treasure that they put into getting a handle on Colombia's narco violence and the almost failed state nature of Colombia in the 1990s and early 2000s. As they do that, the cartels become weaker. And you hear about the atomization uh, or the development of the mini cartels. There's no longer a Pablo Escobar. There's no longer a Rodriguez Oruela brothers in Cali. There, there, there's no cartel that dominates. So what do the Mexicans do? The Mexicans go in, Mexican bad guys, I should say, go in, and they begin to transform themselves from subcontractors who did transportation only up to the U.S. border, where they turned the cocaine over to Colombian distributors in the United States, and that's where all the money is made. They basically became wholesalers. They took it off the wharfs in Buenaventura, they took it from the Guajira, and they said, thank you, we'll take it from here. What that results in is a tremendous expansion of the distribution networks in the United States. When I was a kid growing up in New York, Jackson Heights was the epicenter of Colombians, and that's where cocaine came to and was distributed from. You look across most of the United States, most of the coke, and then you've got to add heroin, methamphetamine, and marijuana as well, is distributed by Mexican-controlled gangs reporting back to a cartel. And this also is a driver of violence because the word, the very word cartel, couldn't be a greater fallacy. Their cartels are economic groups that collude to fix prices and markets. The last thing these guys do is fix prices and markets and, co and cooperate. What they do is they kill each other at the cyclic rate to take over the plazas. They try to, by force of arms, intimidation, they try to push one guy out, push the other guy in. Famous group of enforcers called La Linea was the Juarez cartel that sought to draw a line and say, the Sinaloa guys come no further than here. Tremendous violence as a result of that. And you have other violence that has resulted as, uh, as uh, the dispersion of the cartels. There was a time when there was a Guadalajara cartel and there was sort of like a five families New York mafia arrangement. That's long, long gone. But you look at other types of violence that they go into, extortion, kidnapping, carjacking, 
arms trafficking, etc. Another undeniable cause of the violence in Mexico from 2007-8 on has been the flooding of weapons, mostly illegally exported from the United States into Mexico. That is a result uh, or that is a result of the incredible accumulation of money. Instead of money being repatriated back to Colombia for the cocaine primarily, it goes to Mexico. They have more disposable cash. They buy higher grade weapons. Resilience. Let me give you a couple of reasons for guarded optimism. Um, the, the, the governmental response. Um, when President Calderon comes in for the very first time, we see an extended hand that says, look, I got a serious problem. Mexico cannot become the genuine first world type of country we envision in its potential, which the United States fully shares, if it allows for the existence, uh, coexistence of organized criminal gangs like this that create this kind of violence. And again, they're not the only drivers of violence. I'm only talking about them right now. So we get that. And what Calderon does is very interesting. He says, and it's not because we can't handle it on our own. It's because you owe us this. Your market in the United States, your illegal weapons, are part of why our cartels have become so empowered. We say, you're absolutely right. Ergo, the birth of the term co-responsibility in regards to U.S.-Mexico law enforcement cooperation. It's a great thing. It's also an incomplete thing. There's a lot of disinformation uh, about Merida. I will only say here, but I'm happy to take questions later. It is not not a security strategy. It is a comprehensive whole of government rule of law strategy and there are four pillars. And the fourth pillar is building strong and resilient communities. And much of what Enrique said and what my colleagues will say, I know that I will agree with. And we are working on that. I will also say that it's not just the government's job. Getting a handle on violence and reducing violence has civil society and ordinary citizens have a tremendous role to play. And here we go back to some of the organizational, I'm sorry, some of the historical, and, and again, I'm not going to use the word cultural, but the historical and societal attitudes and mentalities. And think it just used the word character. Think about some of, and those of you who may know Mexico or be Mexican will recognize these right away. So think about some of the language that's used in Mexico when you're a kid or growing up and what you learn. El que no tranza no avanza. If you're not scheming, you don't get ahead. Un político pobre es un pobre político. One of their most famous politicians said that. A poor politician, meaning no money, is a bad politician. La mordida, right? The little tax you pay when you want to get a service done. You want to get a license? It costs you a little bit extra. You want to get your milk delivered faster? A little bit extra. These aren't tips. These are sort of institutional what Jorge Castaneda calls corrupción de ventanilla, small-scale, service window kind of corruptions. Think of the way in which Mexicans use the term galloso. Galloso is only Mexican slang. It means somebody who is really smart and knows how to get ahead by getting around the rules. So it all comes back to rule of law. The final thing I'll say, because Lynn would just shut the one-minute sign at me. Think of this. Anybody who's been to the border knows that there's a tremendously homogenous Valle population. They're Mexicans, they're Americans, they're Mexican-Americans, they're legal, they're illegal. It's the same people wherever you go across that border. Families are divided by a border. They like to say, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. It's very, very true. So if you have the same people with the same sorts of values, and you take any pair of sister cities, Reynosa, uh, McAllen. You have more guns on the United States side. They're legal. You can go to Billy Bob's gun shop and you can buy one. You have more dope on the U.S. side. That's where the market is. That's where the markup is the highest. And you actually have, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, higher populations of the same poorly educated sort of dead-ender types on the U.S. side than you do on the Mexico side. So why do you not have grenades thrown at City Hall in McAllen, but you do in Reynosa. Why do you have the spectacular violence on the Mexican side and not on the U.S. side? And the answer, I believe, is very simple. It boils down to rule of law. It boils down to impunity. And an understanding, a societal understanding, that if I commit a crime, if I engage in violent behavior on the Mexican side, 
I have statistically less than a 2% chance of being caught and sanctioned for it. Not the case in the United States. Um, I think that that was actually a very good segue um, to sort of what I'm going to speak about uh, with my few minutes. Um, because as Tani mentioned, I'm coming here from the Institute for Economics and Peace. So what we are trying to do as an organization is to put metrics around peacefulness and to use those measures to try to understand levels of peace, drivers of peace, and the economic impacts of peace. So I'm going to be coming a little bit more from a data perspective to talk about uh, resilience and positive peace in Mexico today. And I think what we've found in our work is that the, the findings of our recent studies in Mexico support um, the types of comments that John was making and that Enrique was making before. And I hope that that is helpful, too, for people in the room who are more on the advocacy or programmatic side. Um, I think one of the panelists earlier today spoke about everybody speaking to like-minded people in this type of field. And so I'm assuming everybody in this room is a, is a like-minded person. And hopefully, I can provide a little bit more um, quantitative information that will be helpful in furthering what I hope is a shared goal. Um, as you know, we produce the Global Peace Index every year. And so that looks at peacefulness across 162 countries. But we've been really fortunate to be able to produce two editions of a Mexico Peace Index, where we can look at a sub-national level. And what we're doing there is we're bringing together a range of variables. So we're looking at indicators like homicide, organized crime, justice efficiency, and sets and victimization surveys to present this type of snapshot of the 32 states. And sorry, I'm just going to grab this from you. And here's a timeline. It's similar to what you saw in terms of the trend in homicide rates that Enrique presented. Um, what I want to point out, and, and this includes all seven indicators, is that what we've learned from aggregating this data from 2003 to 2014 is that perhaps we're in a moment of opportunity and transition for Mexico. So I think that the, the graph of homicides that we looked at before stopped in, in 2009 or 2010. You'll see that same sort of spike here um, where violence has increased. Um, but then it's, it's lowering in recent years. But that, that lowering of violence is starting to plateau. So we saw this rapid increase from 2005 to 2011. But from 2011 to now, we've seen a 16% increase in peace. But that's only 0.7% in the last year. So really, this means that we're at a point, we're at a crossroads point um, for Mexico in terms of violence. Mexico can't sustain or build on these gains in peacefulness unless it can really make substantial investments um, and these investments really need to move beyond viewing the problem simply as one of violence containment. And I think that's what we saw um, in Enrique's presentation, is that it is a systems approach. It is looking at various uh, levels of society. Um, and what I would say is that it needs to look at building a resilient and sustainable peace system. And that's a complicated strategy. And it requires long-term thinking. It requires participation across civil society and government. And it requires an understanding about the conditions in which peace thrives. So thinking about what that optimal environment is that actually helps mitigate violence and sustain peace, my organization would describe this as an environment with higher levels of positive peace. And we're using positive peace to describe the attitudes, institutions, and structures that are associated with more peaceful societies. So this is a model that we've developed of eight factors identified through statistical and empirical analysis of thousands of data sets at the global level. It's meant to represent a holistic framework and an interrelated framework of the drivers of peace. Now, countries that have stronger representation of these eight factors tend to be more peaceful. 
they tend to have better development outcomes, and they're more resilient. And now, understanding what is defined as resilience is a, another challenge, but here we mean that they're better able to withstand shocks, whether they're economic, political, environmental. And when we compare levels of positive peace in a country to levels of violence, we can begin to determine countries that either have a peace surplus, meaning they have a greater potential to improve their levels of peace, or a peace deficit, meaning that they're at a higher risk of falling into violence. And from a global perspective, Mexico is in a unique position to improve its peace. Its potential for peace, as the data shows, and that's measured by the strength of institutions compared to global averages, is greater than its actual peace levels would suggest. So there's some opportunity there. And when we look at this framework, then, in the context of the states of Mexico, and we've been slightly limited by data here, so we're looking um, at the state level, and we developed a Mexico Positive Peace Index. And that's to try to understand which of these eight very broad categories are most relevant to peace. So we took 58 state level indicators, and we found that for Mexico, peace is strongly associated with three factors well-functioning government, low levels of corruption, and good relations with neighbors. But what does this really mean? Indicators of deprivation, such as poverty and low education levels, these are still important factors, and they're still related. But they're not the priority for peace building in Mexico today, and I think that's what we heard from John. These factors indicate that we should look at things in Mexico to strengthen like perceptions of local safety, confidence in the government and justice system to improve public safety, lowering levels of corruption, and increasing community participation in local problem solving. So while tackling corruption and government, governance are clearly priorities, What's important to note here is that this also moves us beyond thinking solely in terms of government performance as an indicator and to include citizen engagement and social capital as predictors of peace. And you can find these spaces for engagement across the states. You see citizens reporting, even in states with very high levels of violence, where people could be apathetic, that they have a great willingness to contribute to peaceful solutions. So what this data is showing then is that it starts to provide a roadmap for various levels of policy, for activism, and for programming. And it encompasses things that are happening in Mexico, like implementing a new justice system, like professionalizing local police services, implementing anti-corruption measures, creating spaces for citizen reporting and transparency, developing safe community spaces with light fixtures, parks, community centers. So there are these spaces for opportunity and for concentration. I think that as a peace building community, we see that violence has a tremendous social impact, that there are tragedies going on in Mexico, that Mexico's in the papers constantly beaten down by high levels of violence internationally. But we need to also think about where there are areas to engage, and we need to convince all levels of society, from private sector to government, that there are real areas um, for policy change. And if you need one final thought to convince your private sector partner, there are clear economic gains. The economic impact of violence in Mexico last year was 3 trillion pesos. That's 17% of Mexican GDP. Businesses report. 4% of their operating costs going to violence containment. So if somebody isn't swayed by the humanitarian argument, perhaps they'll be swayed by the economic one. Thank you. I'm very glad. I'm very glad to be the last, because thanks to what our, my colleagues has, have put on the table, I will try to make a sort of hypothesis or of uh, knockdowns reflections. Uh, of course, uh, being for you uh, the most representative here of Mexican civil society, especially of that one more independent, critical, and alternative. Well, first, 
We have a very strong debate on what is the main character of the actual crisis in Mexico. And I find eight positions from those who consider that the nation itself is the one in crisis, that we are in so high grade of dependence that Mexico is not anymore but a symbolic framework, to those passing by the crisis of state, of political regime, economical model, etc., etc., crisis of security, crisis of justice and human rights, eight positions. But my hypothesis is that the problem is that behind each position, uh, we have a very dispersed energy. And uh, our main challenge now is how to build up a common general agenda on what are the main routes and steps to go on, even with our differences. But if we can reach at this moment a general common agenda, we are still working in a very uh, scattered process which doesn't help us to go to the bottom. Second, I agree, and uh, since Tani said it, of course we have different drivers of violence. Uh, six, coming from the structural, coming from those uh, because of the spoliation of land of resources, etc., etc., uh, including, of course, the one of the combat of against the criminal organizations, including the 24 crimes, not only drug trafficking and producing. Uh, but here the main problem is that we don't have, again, a common diagnosis. We have clarity of the different maps of each kind of violence, but we don't have a common combination of the maps that help us to understand a deeper uh, diagnosis and, of course, make possible for us to the design of a deeper strategy. We don't have that approach. And again, the, the main vision of Mexican government is related to security, not to the rest of the causes, not to the rest of kinds of violence, and therefore, the Mexican government strategy has not is not been enough to resolve and to understand the complexity of Mexican violence. It's a pity to say, but of course uh, not as historical culture, but violence as way of resistance is being converted as culture in some regions in Mexico. So things are uh, getting worse and worst, and again, we need again a uh, new diagnosis, new strategy. And uh, for us as civil society, uh, the uh, challenge is not how to be invited to the meetings and to, uh, to the reflections uh, where the government make. We are trying to explain them, come to our vision. It's not only how you use us to support your vision or legitimize your strategy. We need to accept us not only as another actors, but another vision, another way to understand this, and we are not fitting like this. The formal acceptance of Mexican society in these issues is very formal. It is getting better, but it is not enough. Here we have historical challenge. Third. Ayotzinapa is a central point of Mexican moment now. The dispute on what happened there, if only a local problem related to organized crime, or if the state itself has been rebelled there, and the consequence of what is the root of transformation that Ayotzinapa needs to be understood and resolved, explained the very tense and crucial moment we are living. And uh, from now, we have a discussion of different scenarios. But uh, this year, 2015, is considered to be a very uh, strategic year because five crises are to be included in the Mexican moment. And the dispute on who is going <coughs> to conduct the path to resolve this new crisis uh, 
is explaining us what it is happening nowadays. The economical crisis, the political crisis because of the insufficiency of the political dialogue, the electoral crisis, and especially because of the untrust, untrust on political parties, the crisis on credibility, derivated of the corruption information we have known recently, the, the crisis, uh, the security crisis, even places that, that have been controlled, now they are getting again in awful situation, and the, the more clear crisis in human rights. And uh, therefore, we know, we feel that with this crucial moment and with this risk and challenge, this year uh, is our maybe first, uh, let me say tennis, because you have a great point, uh, set for match point. We, we are in reaching the match point. The exact moment that if there is to be a new strategic, national, historical initiative, this is our moment. We are very weak actors, even government, states. We are facing this challenge being very little, dispersed and not enough in maturity, in vision, in proposals. But, but I would like you to understand, and we have a very important opportunity. The problem is there are no leaderships. Nobody seems to be able to convince us to that. So maybe that will help us to a very collective uh, proposal. And fourth and final, <clears throat> of course, uh, for us in Mexico, peace has a lot. Peace building has a lot uh, to do uh, related to state building. But for us, beside that, it is a main major effort of society building. We have convinced that, and Juarez is exactly where this experience uh, was born. In the epicenter of violence, Juarez is recognized as the epicenter of social participation. That when civil society is arising, then there are keys and ways and paths and changes and alternatives. So now we have and learn that and our moment is passing through creating subjects, mature, any kind of actors, communities, people, fronts. Uh, we are living a very intensive and diversified moment of mobilization. Maybe it's not clear at the media, even in Mexican media, but please uh, have the good news that we are now in a very strong and diversified uh, moment of expressions. And for us, our proposal is not only peace with, with security. We are trying to restart the deep comprehension of the paradigm of peace with justice, peace with inclusivity, peace with ethics, peace as a way of transforming Mexico. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. It was very Rich set of panels. I appreciate it. Thanks. I'm going to hold my questions, which are several, and open it to uh, the audience. Um, we'll take three questions and, and ask for a round of responses. Patricia? Um, my question is primarily for John, but feel free. Um, I think at the end, you sort of say something that if you come from a Latin country or any country that's experiencing this, is not a big mess for you. you know, the rule of law you can. So my question would be, if we know that, mystery, then, you know, what, in your view, are some of the, you know, initial steps to move in a different direction? Because that is telling us that, like I said, it's not that complicated, I come from Venezuela, so it makes perfect sense. But what would be then the steps that you've seen through your experience that need to take place to change the order of things that perhaps give us hope that something can 
question has to do with what role do you see today for that these institutions are playing, and what role should they play moving forward? Uh, um, say, the, the, the Mexican Navy, the Mexican Army, the Federales, the Municipal, and then Civil Society, something like Todos and What are the what relationship do those actors have now, and the roles they play, and what roles should they play you know, as we move forward in this? So, um, hearing the themes of institutional violence, bias, perhaps in policing, opportunities for community policing in Mexico, um, some of you also mentioned uh, micro levels of violence, micro levels of peace. And then we were talking exclusively about Mexico, but it made me think about the U.S. actually, um, and what we're seeing here. So I just would like to open that question. Did you reflect your question? Yeah, I mean, just I, mean, I summarized some of the themes I heard in talking about Mexico, and I was sitting here thinking, I get it for Mexico, but what does it mean here in our country with some of the events we've seen more recently, yes. but really a history and a culture um, of bias, perhaps in the police force, racism. Yes. Now, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, let me start with uh, the first one, Patricia, and thank you. I think um, much of what I think is in the solution um, we've uh, we've discussed here. Uh, the first, I think, is the absolute need to rebuild trust between the governed and the governors, and that is at every single level. Uh, Mexico, to a certain extent, suffers, I believe, from a very presidentialist history very presidentialist system. There is a belief that if the president himself is not attending to your problem, and we saw this recently, you see it, we saw it with Ayotzinapa, how long it took for the president to meet, uh, how long it took for the president to engage directly with him. There's a sense almost of the old, uh, this is historical, and this is also throughout the rest of Latin America, and it's also true here in the United States to a certain degree. If my particular problem of violence isn't being attended to by the president personally, I'm not getting the appropriate government response. You've got to change that culture, and you have to understand that the, the response has to come out of something like todos somos Juarez. So when you get, and Mexicans are real good at going to the streets. I mean, if you take a look at you know the tragedy of Javier Cecilia and his son, and you look at how Mexicans, and, and this was part of the governing deal under the PRI, you can march all you'd like. Just don't break any rice bowls of the elites. Don't try to make any structural changes. Mexico historically does not have a strong civil society. And as I think Miguel has said, it's beginning to emerge. I see that as a very positive indicator. The second thing has to be when you talk about the relationship between the governed and the, and the governors um, and trust, you have to have community involvement to be able to do things like uh, call in 911s, uh, denuncias uh, in, in Spanish, the idea that people are willing. I used to tell this to people all the time. How many of you who live in Juarez or who lived in, you know, um, in, in conflicted areas, in the very small areas, if you had a brother who all of a sudden was involved in something that you knew was fishy, all crime is local, everybody has family, and Latin Americans in particular have enormously strong family values. If all of a sudden your brother starts to drive a much nicer car, starts to sport a Rolex watch, starts to have a lot of cash that he's flashing around, and you know something is happening, how many of you would go and tell the local police? Now the first answer I would always get is, well, I'd never tell the police because they're probably corrupt too. That's cheating. How many of you would find out a way to get to your brother, or how many people just sort of accept that, pues, el que no tranza no avanza. And please, God, I'm going to go to the Virgen de Guadalupe and I'm going to pray that my brother's okay. And then your brother turns up missing and you find out there was a shoot. That's micro. That's incredibly micro. But that gets replicated over and over and over in the barrios that uh, Enrique was showing up there in Juarez. And the final thing I would say is that you absolutely have to change the justice system. And Mexico is in the process of doing that. And if you take a look at the four states that have completely implemented the new penal code and work now in an accusatorial system, which just structurally is better. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to diss Napoleon and his code, but a Napoleonic code of justice is like tailor-made uh, 
for suborning, intimidating, etc. When you have open trials, when you have evidence that's put in front of people, and Mexico is changing, they're not going to a jury system, but they're going to an open accusatorial system, you build that confidence. Things like alternate drug courts, which we are working on with them, have a tremendous level of effectiveness. So it's, it's not, there's no one panacea, but it all boils down in my mind to recreating spaces where there is trust between the governed and those who are governing them. And I would argue that it, 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 it has to be met in the middle. There's no one thing. This is also true historically of Mexicans. There is a sense that my government owes me. Historically, why? Because that's what the pre created. The old pre created an idea that I will pay you to vote for me, I will put you on a bus to go and vote for me, and then I will give you what you need. And the idea of social mobility in Mexico 50, 60, 70 years ago was nil. Where you were born is where you died. You did what your father did. There was very little social mobility unless you came to the States. That has to change, and I think it is changing. The final thing I'll say is the investment uh, that has to be made in this. It cannot be all governmental. It must come from the private sector. It must come from creating places where people can... Uh, I've never met a Mexican who doesn't have three jobs. I say that not jokingly. Everybody has a main job. Everybody has two secondary jobs. They work in the informal sector. You have to restructure tax codes. You have to get people involved in the formal sector. You have to have them banking. You have to create trust and a social compact that is in the process. I, I, I am optimistic that it's happening, but I also think it has to be generational. It's not going to happen overnight or in one political administration, whether it's U.S. or Mexico. I want, I want to address Mark's and a little bit of Patricia's uh, question with one answer. I think um, in the in the in the landscape of things and the efforts that the Mexican government has been trying to put together, also in cooperation with the, with the United States and talking about the four pillars, I I believe that we're still missing a unified theory of change. Uh, if, if you follow the uh, implementation of the four pillars, for example, and you map them out, you won't find that they are geographically connected, for example. Right? That's, that's one, just one example of how that works. And I think that I'm, I'm using that example because it's, it's completely mimicking what happens, uh, what happens uh, inside the Mexican government. If you go to the Mexican government and you show up in the, in the crime prevention on their ministry, and you try to find the linkage they have to this process of improving the judicial system, you won't find a connection. If you go there and you say, well, what's the connection you have with uh, federal police? Very weak, some meetings, obviously. There's, there's people talking to each other, but not necessarily there's someone saying, okay, this is a complete idea of how we will address this problem. Yes, it has to happen at every level. It has to like governments tend to be big, so you might have people thinking and working in the long term, uh, judicial reform, thinking in 20, what's that, 12, 2016, 2016 for, for the judicial, but the, like expecting results to be um, in place in, the 20, in, in 2020, for example. But you need people to start thinking on Ajotzinapa, right? You need people to address human rights issues today. So you have to really come up with a, with, a, with a sound strategy that is bringing together different time frames, different geographies, and within that theory of change, I think there's room, obviously, to identify where the Navy, uh, the, the Army have a role. But mostly, I think the big, big gap we're facing today on, on the one that we're lagging um, um, on is uh, police reform. I feel police reform, uh, especially at the local level, there's no way the federal police will be able to, to cover those, those gaps. Um, the, the, the discussion today about making police, uh, bringing police at the state level or the local level, I think it's a very important discussion to have. There's no one size fits all, I think, uh, for a country as diverse as Mexico. Uh, I know the Colombians did well with the national police, but that's not a federation. Right. Like, the John, like the one that John described. So, so I believe this is a very important discussion and the role of police 
again, I'm, I'm not a police, I'm not a, a super fan of police necessarily, but I strongly believe that if we not, do not improve law enforcement in Mexico, we won't be able to see the results that we want to see. Uh, we are advancing, I think, in, the, in different directions. Um, that's that's uh, my, my take on that. Very quickly also, uh, uh, I have had experience and the opportunity of being in the United States for the last year and a half. I spent last year in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, I've been working a lot with David Kennedy at John Jay College, seeing the implementation of their strategies, uh, particularly in New Haven, on focus deterrence. So I have also the, had a chance of walking the streets of New Haven as much as I had the chance of walking the streets of, of uh, Ciudad Juarez. And, and to tell you the truth, I see a lot of similarities. When you, when you, at the end, when you are in a community in New Haven or in Ciudad Juarez and you're talking to a group of kids in the street, the kind of feeling, the kind of driver that they have in them, themselves to be, uh, uh, be involved in violence is exactly the same. The idea of respect, the idea of belonging, the idea of uh, uh, um, uh, honor are very present in young people everywhere in the world. And when these, uh, these uh, uh, concepts and, and, this, and these ideas in themselves are very low, when they have very low self-control, uh, you will see the type of violence we see uh, either in uh, Baltimore or in Ciudad Juarez, especially when, we, when, when you address the, the local level. Obviously, you have other, other structural drivers, but I, I, tend, I try to think also uh, in terms of how, wh where do you start? You have root causes of violence and you have triggers of violence. You have things that really, really, you know, Trigger, trigger violence, where, where do you start? And I think we have made so many efforts on, on addressing root causes that we sometimes forget, and this is something the US is doing really well, to understand the nuances of intervening right before violence is about to explode, and then creating the space for other services to chip in and, and address root causes. I think uh, with this, I would like to, to try to explain that there are a lot of similarities and there's so much at the local level that Mexico has to learn from what the US has done to reduce for 20 years now uh, the murder rate. Thank you. Let's take three more questions. Do you think we could go five minutes over? Then we'd since we started a little bit late. Would you give us permission? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, we'll take three more questions and I think we'll have to be a little bit succinct this time around. The Thank you. Yeah, what different scenario. 
one that uh, Mr. Gandara uh, mentioned about uh, uh, a lack of a common uh, diagnosis and, and overall strategy and, and picture on where things stand and where to go. Okay, we'll have to talk about okay. Well, that, what, what I'm wondering is if that, uh, that perspective, that framework might be helpful addressing the kind of issues you're dealing with in terms of common language, common perspective, and how to keep track of things and track it and, and move it forward to positive piece specifics. Thank you. This question, you and then uh, very briefly, <coughs> thank you very much to the participants. And specifically uh, perhaps Damia, but when we you were talking about the drivers of peace and the civil society. I didn't hear, to hear anyone mention anything about the role of churches, the Catholic Church. Where is that? Is that a, a driver? What about those base communities? What about the, the uh, rural structure, the presence of the uh, church in the rural areas? And what about the burgeoning evangelical movement? Where do all of those fit in? What do they contribute to the process of peace or to Two of the presentations, Enrique, you specifically referenced social norms, and John, at the end, I heard you make allusions to social norms by those fantastic quotes that you gave, because those are indicators of some of the unwritten rules and expectations. Um, yet, we haven't heard very much said about how you use and you work with social norms and these solutions, and I wonder, what are you seeing in terms of programming to shift social norms, and or what would you like to see? <coughs> Carpenter from the Peace San Diego. I'm sorry that I missed most of your uh, talk. I want to ask a question and then offer a resource. The question has to do with um, communitarian police, uh, maybe particularly in Guerrero State, but also around the country. I know in some cases they've emerged and are playing a positive role in the peace preparing in some places, and in others. Let me suggest that Michelle, would you like to uh, respond? And then if each of you would like to take one minute maximum, and then we'll let Miguel close up. Okay. I just wanted to go back quickly to Jessica's question about the US um, versus Mexico. And I think what's interesting here is that, first of all, I'm glad that you asked that question. I was in a lot of conferences around peace the last couple of weeks, and there's been very much a a kind of, this is something that we're dealing with in, in other countries and looking at really very fragile situations. And, and I've seen a big gap in making the parallels between um, issues that are going on in the US right now and what's going on just south of our border or, or in, in other countries. And, and I agree with John and Enrique. And I just wanted to add that I think there's a big, you know, one of the words that we haven't said in terms of thinking about inclusivity is also about fairness. And that's a big issue with police and the populations they're policing, with courts and the populations that they are trying, is that people feel that the system in which they're operating is fair. So it's a just system to them. And if they feel like they're not included, that they are a population that um, is 
is out of the system and that they aren't being treated fairly, then those are trigger type issues. And I think this is something that we see very clearly happening in the US right now and, and would behoove us to pay a little bit more attention to of thinking about maybe our own as Americans, who those of us who are, American moment of trying to address um, some of these issues. Perhaps we are also in, in crisis there. Um, community policing is used across a variety of areas. It's used in peace building. It's used now more and more in countering violent extremism programs. You know, it is a resource and it's not perfect and it's, it's different in different uh, scenarios, but it is a way to try to create more inclusivity. Um, another point on that just is around really the the role of corruption and increasing trust and, and what we've seen at the global level mirrors what we're seeing um, in our work in Mexico is that corruption is a key driver of violence. Lower levels of corruption help sustain greater levels of peacefulness and it's particularly corruption in the police um, and rule of law forces that has the strongest impact. So rebuilding trust between um, police and citizens and those who are governing and those who are governed is key. Um, thinking about uh, the role of churches, I don't think that the role of churches are, should be considered a, a driver of peace in this context. Churches and um, faith can be a channel for an interfaith dialogue or for peaceful um, negotiations or for citizen engagement. But I don't think that you see a relationship between higher levels of faith or higher number of, of um, churches and faith actors and higher levels of peacefulness necessarily. OK, one minute. I'll go real fast. Mary, you gave yourself away. You worked a lot in Central America. Base communities, not a term that's used in Mexico. Remember, Mexico, very unique history, very secular state. You had the Cristeros. You had a history of the church being, like all things, under the old pre-system, relegated to its space. Uh, in point of fact, I would, I would say, and this is anecdotal and it's my opinion, this is not an official government opinion, I actually think that the Catholic Church, um, and I'm Catholic, um, hurts in the sense that what you find is the syncretism of Malverde, the patron saint of the narco traffickers, the syncretism of um, folks who actually, and this happened in Colombia as well, with you know Nuestra Señora de los Sicarios, uh, Our Lady of, of the Assassins, um, that allows for a church superstructure. The church is still enormously powerful, regardless of the secular nature of Mexico's governance for the last hundred years, but. The, you know, you have narco traffickers who live to get their kid baptized by, you know, high ranking priests. They do it and then they get their pictures in the Mexican edition of Ola magazine. Um, I have not seen the church as a driver um, in those small instances. The vast majority, obviously, of Catholic Church is not involved in that. They do marvelous work in Mexico. But they have stayed in sort of a parochial role, uh, traditional role, and they, I have not seen them step out in the way in which, when you go back to John Sabrino and the people in the Yuga, in El Salvador, and, you know, liberation theology, that, to me, in my observation, it has not played a huge role. With regard to social norms, um, we do a tremendous amount of work with Mexico at Mexico's invitation, working through the Merida Initiative in that pillar four on culture of lawfulness. Um, and this is something that has been enormously tested, enormously successful. We are fortunate in the Mexican context that you really don't have, like you did in Bosnia, you don't have sectarian or ethnic or religious lines to cross, but you do have that tremendous culture of non-lawfulness that has been ingrained over 80 years. If you did it in Great Britain, the same thing would happen. Speaking to police reform, if you remember, you know, anyone who's ever been to London and you see the bobbies with the little hat on, they come from, the term bobby comes from Sir Robert Peel, who reformed the British police. It's a fascinating history. If you go and you look at that, if you look at what they did in New York City, and I come from a family of cops and firemen, I am pretty big on cops, but I recognize that my uncles who were cops were not enlightened cops. 
they were the kinds of guys who went to work with an us versus them attitude. Look at all of the work that has been done, and this gets to your question, Amy, about communitarian police. Very simply, because I don't want to abuse the clock, communitarian police, bad. Community police, good. If it doesn't come from a structure of governance, in general, self-protection forces, um, you know, we, we saw them all throughout Central America, campesino groups who admittedly are stepping up to do protection. That's basically the mafia. That's how in New York City where I grew up, that's what you had. You had enforcers. So I could go and walk into Bensonhurst at 2 a.m. in 1975 and know that nothing would happen to me because I look like me. I don't look like her. If she walked in as an African-American, you'd have serious trouble. That won't happen if you have genuine community policing. And I would also just make an observation, and I'm not an expert on this either, but if you took a look at many of the cops in Baltimore who were attempting to prevent the violence, they were African American. I think the trust that gets built, now Bosnia may be a different scenario and where you do have ethnic uh, and, and, and religious sectarian lines that go back a millennia, uh, it's a little tougher challenge. But I think that the whole key has to be professional police who have a career path, who are rewarded for what they do, which is to impose law and order, not, I shouldn't say impose, that create, who create the conditions for law and order, respecting human rights, respecting the legitimate grievances of populations. When you get to there, it doesn't matter the national origin of the person wearing the uniform. What matters is the trust that they can build. quickly on, on the norms. I, I, I believe there's a great opportunity in obviously tweaking the incentives and there are approaches like the focus deterrence approach that blends in uh, at the same time uh, the threat of the state, right? Law enforcement with, uh, with social opportunity and the moral voice of the community. So those three factors really help to change the trend. I also believe that combining that with the new science of social network analysis uh, allows you to understand much better how people, how groups really interact, how they cooperate, how do they, those, those systems really interact. Very important concept, I think, uh, just to leave it there. Uh, resilience uh, ha can be positive. I mean, corruption is a form of resilience, if you, if you understand it to the, to the most uh, detailed level. And, and just, just understanding that sometimes resilience has to be really in, in informed by, by uh, positive resilience. And, and with that, I also touch with uh, the idea of the com uh, communitarian police. Obviously, co the communitarian police is a resilient uh, response of uh, a group of people who are, who are in, in the need of uh, defending themselves. I, I, I agree with the idea that it's not something you, you, you want uh, in, in, a in a culture of uh, <coughs> You want to, to build a, 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 um, a, a, the rule of law, when you have to, be, to build a state of rule of law. I'm going to let uh, Miguel Alvarez, who has given a little bit more time to of course. for some last thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Six uh, Twitter style uh, comments. <laughs> First, the main rule we should change is related to the need of the transformation of our political regimen. Because there is where our programmed, programmed, the whole way to generate power, impunity, corruption, authoritarianism, etc. Second, how to be able to reach that condition of overview, diagnosis, and strategy. For me, the central issue is how to put together, how to resolve the disface between the drug dose in Mexico, which is very strong, very diversified, with a very different thematics, with the first drug, which is very weak, only with political parties. If we find how to reach a conditions for a dialogue, maybe we can be able to do that. Third, to understand new Mexican society, maybe uh, the point is not, please don't look at phenomenon in the institutional field. 
it is happening outside the institutions. Even religiosity is happening outside temples, uh, cultural new alternatives or new politics. And it's happening, not in the institutional. So we need to understand new spaces, new faces, maybe not in the traditional ways. Four, uh, uh, for Mexican, it is very similar to what happened to Latin American church. We suffered a very strong policy of Pope Juan Pablo to control every bishop or religious leader. community related to theology of liberation. But still, the ecclesiastical based communities and good experiences are there, and we have very hope that with Francisco and now with San Romero, uh, the shining of the uh, church with uh, these processes will help that the, that the religious factor becomes stronger for the unification of efforts and all that. Five, I am personally the mediator of some of the experience of the political, uh, the communitarian police in Guerrero to the government and to federal government. Uh, and I know the experience in another sites of Mexico. I consider to be four models. Uh, and only that related to a system of justice has been successful. The other more uh, immediate response uh, have been weak for support the detention. And final, um, Yes, I accept Mexico as a very difficult historically, cultural, maybe psychologically relation with the US. Yes, I accept we have a challenge. But please accept that uh, from this side, uh, many, many times we come and yes, we find some solidarity, but we don't find the interest of understanding our issues as common issues. And if we are able that the common problems that we now face, all the demonstration not only in Baltimore, the, from three years from now, you have faced this phenomenon. We will be most uh, happy to be able to talk in the new terms, new, new agenda among us. So we have a yes, the challenge on how to make bridge and how Fruitful, something like that. I want to thank uh, the panelists. It's a very rich and diverse discussion, and the audience for very good questions and an exchange. Um, it's a very, thank you very much. Thanks, Tani, as well, for moderating a great uh, discussion as well as a uh, panelist. And for all the participants, I want to invite you outside. Uh, we are going through our gallery walk. These are uh, photographs and artwork uh, contributed both by Alliance for Peace Building uh, board member Dr. Tom Farah and our USIP Afghanistan team. Each, uh, each piece of work is a reflection on a uh, landscape uh, throughout the world uh, where peace building is underway and, uh, and success is being made. In particular, our USIP Afghanistan team has a, uh, has a rich display of photographs that depicted the work that we did with our local partners to bring about a relatively uh, peaceful and, and violence-free election process this year. Thank you very much for your uh, participation today, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue in day two and three. Thank you.